Good afternoon, everyone, and Happy New Year. Uh, welcome to the University of Michigan webinar series, Victors, Heroes, and Wolverines. My name is Kristen Choi, and I'm a two-time alum of the School of Nursing. Um, I graduated in 2014 and 2017 with my BSN and PhD, and I'm now a professor of nursing and public health at UCLA, as well as a psychiatric nurse. Many of you may know that 2020 was declared the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife by the World Health Organization and was intended to be a year celebrating the contributions of nurses to health and healthcare. Uh, unfortunately, it turned out to be an entirely different kind of year for nurses uh, with the coronavirus pandemic. We saw nurses on the front lines uh, really doing a lot of the core of life-saving work that uh, we've needed to fight this pandemic. Um, and unfortunately, it's also led to a lot of questions about the future of healthcare and what we need to do to make our healthcare systems better and more equitable for everyone. I'm honored today to introduce this session about the University of Michigan School of Nursing's contributions to responding to the pandemic. Um, this uh, session is entitled Leading Care and Treatment in the Clinics in the Classroom. And today you'll get to hear from the Dean, some of our faculty and some of our students about what the Wolverine nursing community is doing to respond to the pandemic. With that, I'd like to turn things over to Colleen Zimmerman. She's the Executive Director of Development and Alumni Relations for the School of Nursing, and she will be your host for the webinar today. Good afternoon. Let me join Kristen in welcoming you today. We're pretty proud of our School of Nursing and its community, so I thought I'd take a moment and share a couple facts about the school. The school was established in 1891, which means we've been around for 130 years. We currently have 1,200 students, which include undergraduate and graduate programs. We have 120 faculty and staff, and faculty are made up of nurses and other health disciplines, such as public health and social work. We had one of the first PhD of nursing programs in the country, and as such, we have a very rich research enterprise. We consistently rank as one of the top schools of nursing in the country, always in the top 10. Today, you'll be hearing from select individuals that represent each of the school's key missions with the lens on COVID-19 and how we continue to move, move forward even during a global pandemic. Let's get started by introducing Dean Patricia Hearn, Patty, into our conversation. Dean Hearn has been Dean since 2015 and re has recently been reappointed to her second term. She is a formal, former, critical care nurse and a neuroscientist who studies stroke therapies. Dean Hearn, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here, Colleen. Thanks so much. You're welcome. So why don't we just get into our questions because I know we have a lot of things to cover today. So how did you, how did COVID first impact the school and its mission? Great question. And before I dive deeply into it, maybe I'll start by sharing a little story that I always call the magic of creating a nurse. Because I want you to think for a minute about how our students come to us. These are 18, 19 year olds. They come from high school intending to be a nurse. And these are incredibly bright and talented young people. They come with the highest of GPAs, have done a lot of work in the community. Many of them are already engaged in volunteering and things that are significant in healthcare. And they start to build their identity as a nurse very, very early on in their careers. And as may perhaps some of you know, there are about 3.3 million nurses in the United States. It is the biggest of the health professions. And every year, the Gallup poll, which I think most of us are familiar with, queries the American people to which is the profession that is most trusted. And for 20 years, the American public have argued and, and voted that it is nursing. So our students start to develop an identity as a nurse very, very young. And their experiences are gonna require a great deal of personal maturity. They're going to be exposed to some of the most joyous things in our lives, the birth of babies, the ability to heal, but they also have to manage things like death and illness, handling cancer patients that may in fact not be able to continue with us. And they learn to be consummate educators, learning to be able to teach all of us when we are patients about the care and how to take care of ourselves. 
So they develop all those roles very, very quickly. But in order to do that, their education is actually kind of complicated. They have classroom education, just as most of us have had in our careers. We do have laboratories where they learn things in simulation, but they also spend the majority of their time in real live clinical settings, hospitals, clinics, communities, schools. So all of these pieces are what it goes into creating a nurse. Now we have graduate students and many of these same people that I'm talking about go on to take graduate degrees to become advanced practice nurses, scientists, and healthcare leaders. So that's the magic that we have here every day. When COVID struck last March, I think that's a fair time to call it, we immediately knew that we were going to have to work very quickly to change how we would manage their education if they were going to meet the professional goals that they came here and want and already identified with. But we also knew that we were going to have to protect our faculty who were at considerable risk. The majority of our faculty are frontline nurses who provide care and services to patients and communities. And these are the same people that are teaching those students. So protecting our faculty was something we had to work on very quickly. We also had to ensure that our research, much of which is funded by the NIH and other federal organs or agencies, would continue even though we were working under lockdown condition. So every day we learned more about COVID and what it would mean. There were new challenges that popped up, some of whom we're still wrestling with. So what were some of those challenges and how did you address, address them? Well, one of the first one and one that continues today is what I call the tension between safety and the demands of our students' clinical education. That is a tension. We want to make sure that they're safe, but at the same time, they must be in live clinical settings getting their education. So there's a tension between those two things that we felt immediately. And we took many, many measures to keep our students as safe as we could. And we have marvelous clinical partners, including Michigan Medicine and over 40 other sites in the state of Michigan where our students go for their clinical training. An example of how we handled it is that we, in agreement with our clinical partners, said our students would not take care of COVID positive patients unless they were in a setting like the emergency department or the ICU where we might not know necessarily who was COVID positive. And some of our students volunteered to take care of COVID positive patients, particularly our seniors, because our seniors, as you might imagine, are getting ready to graduate and they already know a great deal and have a great deal of expertise. So that tension still exists for us today. We also felt a lot of pressure of time. We really had to move quickly because the students had to stay in their programs to be able to graduate on time, which as you might imagine is pretty important, and also to progress through their education because in nursing every year is linked to the next. We had a, a fairly large uh, advantage in some ways because the school had started to build some very sophisticated online digital programs over the last couple years. And so we could step in and use those very quickly to be able to teach what we could remotely and what we couldn't in clinical settings, we would do all we could do to, to assure that people were safe. We also had to think about service, service to patients and clients, because remember our students at all levels provide real meaningful care. It is not an academic exercise. And then lastly, Colleen, I think one of the biggest challenges, and that's been true across the university, but was especially true for our students, is to preserve the community of Michigan nurses. Students come to Michigan because they're part of something bigger than themselves, bigger even than their own schools. And so we've had to work in many ways, whether it's uh, having distanced yoga on the lawn, whether it's been virtual luncheons, whatever we could to be able to preserve that sense of Michigan nurses in the community. 
so what lessons have you have you learned and what will stay with you long after the pandemic is over? Great question. One of the things that I believe so strongly is that in academia, in university settings, we're there to educate our students for the future as much as the everyday present. And that's particularly true for nurses. Our job is to educate them about the healthcare that they will create, transform, and sustain in the future. I want them to leave knowing what they need to know and how they can grow and be excellent with an eye on the future of five to 10 years. And in some ways, COVID has been really helpful with that. Because we've had to move so quickly in healthcare to get the things we needed to be able to take care and provide education, provide continuing research, all the things that healthcare does, COVID helped us think about how much better we could be at telehealth. So we've incorporated that into the education of the future of our students. It's shown us that population health and population health nursing, not just what happens in hospitals, but what happens in the community is highly important. And we've developed and strengthened that and are doing so every day. So our students are competent and excellent in all the settings that they practice in. I think they also have learned and we learned that we have really, really a deep appreciation for what I call the interfaces in healthcare. Moving from hospital to ambulatory clinics, to home care, to all the things that healthcare are about. And so in having to deal with those things now, I think our school, our students, what we teach and how we teach is even stronger. I think that the last thing I'd say that's really been eye-opening has been how when you really work at it in a sophisticated, technologically driven, but student-centered way, you can provide some parts of their education in what we call a hybrid manner, partially in person, partially remotely. And we've learned to be, I think, much better at that than we ever thought we would be. But it doesn't change the fact that the majority of our students come to the University of Michigan for the whole experience. And we are looking forward to be able to move into a time where, again, being part of the community, the in-person education, to be able to go forward with what you have to learn to be that nurse will be safe, will be friendly, and will be all the things that a University of Michigan education really offers. So back to you, Colleen. Well, we have one question, Dean, um, and that is how did you balance student safety and protection of students with students' desire to help in the pandemic response? Ah, a wonderful question. The students uh, had to learn very quickly a great deal about the disease and giving them credit day by day, they stayed as in touch with the evolving pandemic, what it meant scientifically, what it meant for healthcare. And I think that really helped them understand what they had to do to step up to protect themselves and to protect their colleagues and even to protect the faculty and staff of the university. Uh, we did put some safety guards around where they would go and what they would do, as I mentioned, but they still have a great drive, particularly our more senior students to be able to make a contribution. And with supervision, they were able to do that. They have led blood drives. They have volunteered even today to be greeters in the vaccination. Um, our more advanced students, our graduate students are already registered nurses. And when they are not in classes online or virtual, they're taking care of patients, educating the public, designing healthcare policy, doing all the things that nurses with graduate degrees do. So it's attention, but we are working at it every day. Terrific. Well, thank you for your time and your attention to asking, answering these question, questions. I really appreciate it. We need to move on, but I want to just share really quickly that I'd be remiss if I didn't share with the audience that Dean Hearn has been the perfect leader for this time. As I sat at the table of the school's leadership when decisions were being made and are still being made, that it is Dean Hearn's capable leadership that guided the school so skillfully during the last 10 months. 
So just on behalf of everyone, thank you, Dean Hearn, because I think they need to know that. All right, let's turn our attention to our students. Joining me today is Nathan Stefanovsky, who's a doctoral student in his final year, and Zoe Rattel, who's a junior at the School of Nursing. Um, Nathan, Zoe, welcome. Uh, before we start with some questions, why don't you share with everyone a little bit about who you are, where you're from? Uh, Nathan, would you like to start? Thank you, Colleen. Um, I, uh, my name is Nathan. I'm originally from West Michigan, and I am currently finishing up a terminal degree program, a uh, nursing degree program, the Doctor of Nursing Practice, or as we know, the DNP program. Um, the core of my program is focused on uh, becoming a family nurse practitioner. And the idea is that the DNP, in this case, will take all of what we learn from theory and implement it into practice. And my specific research is focused around hearing health with farmers and mitigating the adverse health effects of um, this through health coaching. Um, I've also completed the Occupational Health Nursing Program and have been active in global health, both in Thailand and Uganda, with support of the University of Michigan. And I've been an emergency nurse for a little over four years, and I recently transitioned at the beginning of the pandemic to being a public health nurse, and I've been there ever since. Terrific. Uh, Zoe, what about you? Uh, my name is Zoe. I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan originally, so I go to school in my hometown. Um, and I'm in the BSN program, which means that I'm going to graduate with my bachelor's of science um, to just get a registered nursing license. Um, I do a lot of things at University of Michigan, research, um, professional clubs, honors, um, nursing student government, um, and that was actually why I chose to come to Michigan, um, just for all of the different opportunities that the school allows. Terrific. Zoe, why don't you start and answer the question about how your educational and work experiences changed during COVID? So on the bachelor's side of things, a lot of us are coming in from high school um, and not really having a ton of um, experience with online learning. So it's definitely been a, an adjustment um, with that. Um, and I'm also, I'm pretty involved, as I said. So trying to figure out how to stay involved um, online has been a big learning experience for me. Um, also learning lots of new time management strategies. Um, and then I also, um, I don't work in the clinical setting right now. I work as a dance teacher, which is a little bit different, um, but learning all of the technology skills from that. Um, and we, we're doing something similar with nursing to, you know, learning Zoom, Cisco, web systems, all those sorts of things. Terrific. Nathan? Uh, I think in regards to education, I think we all fell, and I also speak for my classmates, that the, the academic world kind of flipped upside down. And I think the main question from that was like, how would we accomplish everything in a purely virtual environment? I was transitioning from the clinical portion of my degree to the research and leadership portion. And we had to quickly adapt uh, our ideas and our research projects to be able to function in this virtual plane. For example, like my research focused with farmers, it had to be adapted from meeting them in person to meeting them within, you know, through, I guess in this case, um, we're moved to utilizing telephone to communicate with them for the project. And I think it's been difficult, but I felt supported by faculty during this process. And as I mentioned above, uh, I also transitioned to working in public health and have helped with case and contact investigations while kind of coming up with solutions to help navigate the COVID at the population level. So there's been a few different changes. And then obviously, how do we manage all of those things as a nurse with school and all of that together and everything else going on around? Absolutely. Why don't you take the next question? And that is, what have you found most rewarding in your experiences during COVID? Yeah, so I think, you know, when the world falls apart, or so it seems, uh, how important family and friends are during this process. Um, it has allowed me to take a step back and kind of reevaluate the superfluous from the essential. I've appreciated that my classmates and faculty have had the opportunities to connect more and discuss the challenges we were having in a sort of safe, constructive, and positive environment. And you know, lastly, I've also enjoyed the fact, something a little bit more personal, but you know, I've enjoyed the fact that we can now do conferences virtually, so we don't have to do all this traveling and we can still you know, learn a little bit about everything depending on what conference you go to, so. Terrific. What about you, Zoe? What have you found most rewarding? Yeah, I, um, 
I really have found the clinicals really rewarding. I'm stuck in my apartment most of the week. Um, I don't really leave for much other stuff besides my clinicals. So being able to go into the hospital and working towards a goal is really big for me. Having something that physical that I'm reaching for and like I can see myself making progress is really, really good for my mental health. Um, so yeah. Terrific. So take the next question then. And what has been some of the challenges then that you faced during the pandemic? So I already kind of alluded to this, but self-motivation really has been a big challenge for me, um, getting up in the morning and starting on my work. Um, but I find that I'm, I'm pretty hands-on and pretty involved in everything that I do. Um, so the clinicals really do kind of convince me to keep going, to keep working. Um, and I'm just, I'm really grateful that we had that opportunity to do that this semester or last semester and this semester, I guess. Terrific, terrific. Nathan, what about you? What are some of the challenges that you have faced? I think there's a few things that kind of stand out. One is the, the self-discipline in time management while trying to navigate a world of scholarly work while also dealing with the external stressors of daily life during this whole pandemic. Um, for example, like how do I organize my days where I can still be effective and still feel accomplished? And I'm kind of someone who values in-person classes and collaboration. And this is one of the main reasons I actually chose to go to the University of Michigan, because I think they had a really strong focus in that. Um, I've really kind of had to reevaluate my mindset around education and reshift my approach towards learning, like my personal feeling towards it, and become more accepting of the current circumstances. The other one was my board examinations that I was taking to become a family nurse practitioner got canceled three times throughout this whole ordeal. So I had to just keep going, keep going until it ended up working out well. Terrific, terrific. Well, we only have a couple minutes left. So Nathan, why don't you share with everyone in the last minutes that we have together, something that you want everyone to know about what it's like to be a nursing student during a pandemic. So I think, you know, just in general, overall, I've had a wonderful experience at the University of Michigan, despite everything going on, despite the recent challenges. And I think there are many things to be thankful for. I felt really supported by the faculty here and I'm excited as I transition out of school um, to work in, with the members of my community. And I think you know, we're all in this together or depend on each other and we'll make it through this together. Great, Zoe, what about you? I really think that once again, this clinical experiences are just completely like um, valuable. And I'm so glad that we were able to do that. I, you know, I got to do some stuff that I never thought I would ever be able to do in my life this semester. And I learned so much from the nurses on the floor. I mean, I got to see, I got to help assist a birth on my birthday. So, you know, that's something that I never thought I would be able to do. And many people will never be able to do. Um, and I was able to to experience that. So I think that that's really special and that's the special part of nursing school, right? Terrific. We do have a question for the two of you and that's, do you have a better understanding now of the implications of mental health on physical health given the significant mental health declines due to lockdowns and associated impacts such as, you know, isolation of students and or patients in hospitals and such? So I actually had psychiatric rotation this semester, um, which means that I was on um, the psychiatric floor as both peds and adult um, at Michigan Medicine. And we saw a lot of that. Um, and it was really interesting uh, talking to the patients um, and, and kind of hearing from them about um, their mental health decline during the pandemic um, and just kind of not seeing it as severely in myself, but being able to see in myself and my roommate, like, oh, okay, like, you know, we're stuck in our apartment 24 seven most of the days. And um, those days when I'm going to the clinical, I do feel better at the end of the day. And I do feel like I have more energy. Excellent, Nathan? I think this is a really good question, whoever asked it out there. Um, Cause this is a question that continually comes up amongst my colleagues and everything. and. You know, during this, we've actually had some cool speakers who have come in to kind of address how do we maintain a you know, healthy mind and a healthy body during this process. And I think we're still continuing to learn some of the implications of the mental health uh, impacts that coronavirus is having. And I think we're still learning that as we go. But 
again, back to, you know, sort of my experience in this and my colleague or my classmates experience of this is it's really allowed us to take a step back and realize what's most important. And then once we're kind of able to get into that sphere, really address the things on maintaining a healthy body and a healthy mind, I think in this case. Terrific, I'm so glad to hear that. And the school is providing a lot of resources to our students. So thank you, Nathan and Zoe, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, your great representation of our student body and the wonderful work that you're doing in addition in the clinical as well as your academic studies, so thank you. So it's my honor next to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sue Ann Bell, who is a practicing clinical faculty member and nurse scientist at the School of Nursing, whose expertise is in disaster preparedness and response, community health, and emergency care. She's a member of the United States Health and Human Services National Disaster Medical Team and was deployed in response to COVID. Dr. Bell was truly on the front lines of COVID in the earliest days and has been valuable in bringing her experiences and expertise back to the school and the classroom. Welcome, Dr. Bell. Thank you for having me. Let's see. Um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity today to share about some of my experiences on the front line early in the, early in the pandemic. Um, so my name is Sue Ann Bell. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Nursing. And in my day-to-day -day life, I'm a clinician scientist where I conduct research on disasters and health, particularly on how to promote healthy aging in the face of an increasing number of disasters. And I'm also a nurse practitioner by training. And as you heard, I regularly deploy to disasters across the US as a member of a disaster response team. And today I'll be talking a little bit about my work in disaster response and sharing about three separate disaster deployments I participated in during the pandemic. The first was deploying to the Princess cruise ship quarantines. The second was leading the development of the Michigan Medicine Field Hospital. And the third was supporting the Maryland National Guard to do skilled nursing home site assessments and staff education. But I am trained to take an all hazards approach, which means being ready for whatever hazards come my way, whether it's a fire or hurricane or now a pandemic. And in the slide on my left, the blue arrow is me on my way to Hurricane Irma in a C-17 where I spent two weeks supporting overwhelmed emergency departments. And I left there to spend a month in Puerto Rico responding to Hurricane Maria, where I worked in the equivalent of a field hospital providing basic health care. So I witnessed firsthand the things that I study, health system preparedness, coordination of federal, state, and local health systems with emergency management, and also the consequences on individuals and communities when the effects of a disaster exceed the capacity of the community to respond. <clears throat> Part of being on this disaster response team means that I have the opportunity to participate in the highest level of disaster response training available. And in 2019, I spent a week at the University of Nebraska taking a course in their highly infectious disease training center. And this course was focused on personal, per personal protective equipment use or PPE in a highly infectious environment. And that included learning how to don, which is putting on the PPE and learning how to doff, which is taking off the PPE. And we also worked in a simulated patient care environment in a PAPR, which is a powered air purifying respirator. And it's a type of respirator that filters out contaminants in the air and provides clean air through a battery operated blower, which you can see, see on my back. Um, the red arrow is pointing towards me as we practice providing care to a simulated patient while in full PPE. So that training was essential in my first deployment to the Princess cruise ship quarantines. These were the first federal quarantines in over 50 years and as you know, uh, occurred in response to the coronavirus outbreak on several cruise ships very early in the pandemic. My role was to support the guests, as we were to call them, who were in secure temporary housing. These were some of the first known individuals in the United States with COVID, and there was a great deal of uncertainty about PPE, personal safety, and the transmissibility of the virus. 
I provided health care to the individuals who were in the mandatory quarantine where I monitored them for symptoms of the virus and coordinated transfers um, if advanced care was needed. While this was a group of generally healthy older adults, there were a number who did develop symptoms or become ill. In fact, in the first few minutes of my very first shift, I was called to a patient's room who was ill with symptoms of COVID. I remember the thoughts going through my head as I walked to her room thinking, am I really doing this? Am I really going in and exposing myself to this unknown? And also, is our nation really facing this right now? And then when I went in the room, it was just a person. It was a grandma. She was kind and friendly and brave and just as afraid as me. And she needed my help and I was there to care for her. When I was on shift, I worked, ate, and slept from a tent that when thinking about zones of contamination or exposure was the cold zone, like in the pictures here. And the quarantine facility was in the hot zone and required full PPE to enter. And as you can see, since my grant deadlines don't end for or don't stop while I'm on a deployment, you can generally find me on my laptop during any downtime, such as in the picture above. I spent about 10 days on this deployment, working 12 hour night shifts until the mandatory quarantine period ended for the cruise ship passengers and uh, ended and um, they were able to return home as was I. As this was very early in the pandemic, um, where there was so much uncertainty, I ran into some big issues coming home. I can't give the exact location where I was, but I can say it wasn't Los Angeles. So I was supposed to fly out of a different airport, but I had multiple tickets canceled over multiple days. And I started to get really nervous as there were rumors that airports across the US would close entirely. After my latest flight cancellation, I got rebooked out of LAX and drove my government vehicle there. And this is a picture of uh, I took going down the 405, one of the busiest freeways in the US at around 9 a.m. on a weekday morning. And this is me and myself at the airport where I was the only person at the curb and the only person going through TSA screening. You may notice I'm not wearing a mask in the airport at this time, which was mid-March or end of March, wearing masks in the general public wasn't yet considered necessary. And I also wanted to say that um, a representative from the CDC was on site with us at the quarantine facility in order to ensure infection control and proper PPE use. And the CDC provided me with a letter, uh, uh, return to work letter stating that a mandatory quarantine wasn't necessary as I used appropriate PPE at all times. As I was in the final days of the cruise ship quarantine deployment, I was contacted by UM's chief health officer to ask if I would help lead the development of a field hospital, which at the time was planned for around 1500 beds with the goal of being fully operational in about 10 days. The 10 day number was based on the most current modeling being done at Michigan Medicine at the time, which was predicting an overwhelming surge of, of COVID patients. And one of our first tasks was to identify a site for the field hospital. And we looked at a number of dorms and most of the athletic facilities across campus to try to determine sites where we could safely care for a large number of patients. You can see here, this is two of the football facilities and also the, the new tennis facility. So we decided on the UM, uh, the new UM track facility, which is on South State for a few reasons. It had a lot of indoor and outdoor space. It was adjacent to the tennis facility uh, that could be used if expansion was needed. It was heated and cooled, and it also had um, a, the most up-to-date electrical and Wi-Fi capabilities. It also had a very clear delineation of those hot and cold zones of contamination that I mentioned before. And we decided on this site at around 4 p.m. on a Sunday. And this is what the facility looked like less than 24 hours later, which is a major testament to UM facilities and the athletic department who worked through the night to clear it out. So a big part of my role was to develop the site plan, as in where would we don and doff PPE safely, where would patients be transferred in and out, and where would food be delivered. And alongside this, there was also work being done to determine what kind of patients we could safely care for. Um, could safely accept into the field hospital in terms of how ill they were and also what level of support they might need that we would be able to provide. And the planning was originally done by Michigan Medicine alone. 
And in these pictures, we're refining the AutoCAD layout that was developed um, for patient bed spaces and then trying to tape off patient bed spaces using the most current information we had at the time about safe spacing. But later that planning involved the US Army Corps of Engineers where I worked with them as the healthcare point of contact for the build out of the field hospital. And having the Corps involved was pretty important as they had the experience in field hospital development that we did not and maybe also just as important that the build out with their involvement, the build out could be done with federal funding rather than from Michigan Medicine alone. So alongside the site planning, there was an enormous amount of operations planning to figure out how are we actually going to safely be able to do this. And in this picture, we're working um, inside the, one of the gyms in the, in the track facility with a group of Michigan medicine nurses who are asked to take a leading role in the development of and implementation of the field hospital, um, largely because of their past military or disaster experience. And fortunately, with the public health measures that were put in place in March, the field hospital did not need to open. And once this became clear after about a month, we spent the next uh, several weeks turning our efforts into a manual that will be used in, in the event that we do need a field hospital in the future. And as I understand it, our manual has been shared already with other healthcare institutions across the country who are experiencing a similar patient surge. So as this work went wound down, I resumed my research, including getting back again to a major grant submission around aging and disaster care. But only a week or two later, I found myself back on an empty plane, uh, in an empty airport and on an empty plane. And this time I went to Maryland where at the request of the governor there, our teams conducted voluntary site visits of skilled nursing facilities and did infection control uh, training with nursing home staff. And a smaller part of this mission was also to train staff on how to do testing, and in some cases to do testing ourselves on entire nursing home facilities. And over the course of this deployment, we drove all over the state of Maryland, visiting a wide variety of nursing care facilities, doing testing, training, and site assessments. Despite the ongoing PPE shortage, we were directed to wear one of the highest levels of PPE in order to enter these facilities, in order to avoid any possible risk to the residents. And I couldn't stop thinking of the staff and residents of these facilities who were scared and anxious about the many unknowns of the pandemic, and then to have government officials in to reassure them, rolling up in a Humvee like the one over my shoulder in the picture on the left and looking like space aliens. The tension between protecting their safety from exposure with the fears and anxiety around the pandemic was especially evident. But one of the most rewarding things about this deployment though was the opportunity to teach staff of these nursing care facilities about the safe use of PPE, such as in this picture where we're demonstrating safe donning and doffing on the side of a busy road for lack of a better space. Um, Despite some of the, the shortcomings, this, was, this deployment was one where I felt like we were really making an immediate and needed difference with the staff of these facilities who had not had the opportunity for this training before prior to COVID. Thank you for letting me share about some of my recent experiences as a nurse practitioner during the pandemic. And if you'd like to talk more about this, please send me an email and I'd be happy to talk. Great, hey, Suzanne. Or, I'm sorry, Sue Ann. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. So we're curious about what sort, what experiences have you brought back to the school and shared with students and faculty from your experiences with the medical team? So I have the opportunity to lecture kind of widely across campus about um, um, disasters, disaster response, and healthcare system planning for disasters. And there's uh, a couple core courses at the School of Nursing that I regularly lecture in and have been able to, to um, share some of these experiences and then also provide guidance for the future. You know, as, as an example of um, 
some of my experiences in emergency response. Um, as you know, I participated in the field hospital and I've also been able to um, be a member of the campus vaccine task force and provide some guidance there um, from an emergency response uh, um, background. Well, Sue Ann, thank you for being that brave person that goes into places where many would not. And, and then also bringing those experiences back to the university. Um, Dean Hearn, did you have something you would like to ask? No, I've been uh, extremely fortunate to be able to, uh, to question Dr. Bell about her experiences very deeply. And so I think I've gotten an excellent ability to be able to understand how much of a contribution there has been. I guess where I'd ask you to make a comment mostly for our, our audience is, Sue Ann, you are a nurse, you are a scholar, you are a disaster expert. How, how do you pull it all together? I wish I could say it was because of my excellent time management. Um, I'm not sure that I would say that. I would say that um, one of the most important things to me in being a clinician scientist is being able to be on the ground and experience these events. And I don't think that my research could um, function the way it does without being there um, in these events. And on the other hand, when I am on the ground responding to a disaster, I'm also thinking about my research at the same time. And as you hear me kind of say all the time, my practice informs my research and my research informs my practice. And they're both uh, kind of vitally important to me, um, achieving the kind of um, you know, change in healthcare practice around disasters that, that I'm most interested in. Terrific. Hey, thank you, Dr. Bell. We really appreciate your time and your presentation and the work you're doing. It's just unbelievable. Thank you for sharing. So we're gonna move on today to our final conversation that will be with Dr. Melissa Manolovich. And Dr. Manolovich is a senior faculty member at the School of Nursing. She is the only nurse scientist in the country to lead a highly productive team seeking to advance patient safety by improving communication between physicians and nurses. Dean Hearn is going to have a conversation with Dr. Manolovich about her research and how it had to shift to continue during the pandemic. Dean Hearn. Thanks, Colleen. And welcome, Professor Manolovich. Um, you are internationally known for your research and new techniques that you've developed in the area of patient safety. And I don't think there's anybody in the country who doesn't think about that at some point in time when they're a patient or they have family members or colleagues that are patients because this is so incredibly important to the future of healthcare in this country. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your research so we can have a sense of what that means relative to communication. Thank you, thank you for this opportunity, Dean Hearn, and uh, thank you everybody for being here today. So my program of research seeks to advance patient safety by improving communication. Although it did start out looking, I did start out looking at communication between physicians and nurses, I've expanded now to include communication among other kinds of healthcare providers and also to include patients who are of course the reason why we're in the healthcare profession to begin with. So um, I've been able to expand that and to focus on communication. So this may sound like an obvious question, but yet every day I realize that it's not. Why is the study, the research around communication important? Yeah, it, it, it is kind of amazing, isn't it? Um, poor communication is responsible for the majority of errors and adverse events that occur in hospital settings. It can even lead to death. However, making changes to communication is very difficult because we all think we're great communicators and we don't see the need to change. Um, so for example, in over 50 years of research on communication between physicians and nurses, physicians rate their communication with nurses as good, while nurses rate their communication with physicians as poor. Part of the problem has to do with the way we define communication. So in healthcare, communication is largely defined as a transfer of information or information exchange. So we, you know, information goes from a sender to a receiver and back again. I have chosen to adopt a more broad definition of communication that is uh, understood in the 
cognitive sciences. And that is that communication consists of developing shared understanding. When you think about it that way, it kind of changes the focus a little bit. So I can be pushing out all kinds of information to you, but unless you understand it, you're not going to be able to incorporate it. We're not going to be able to have a joint understanding of what it's all about. So in doing that, I think I'm able to make a unique contribution to this field. So tell us a little bit more about that last statement. What are you doing that you think makes a difference? Well, one of the things I do is I use video based methods to first film a conversation between two or more people. And then I have those same people review the video of their interaction. In reviewing actual footage of their communication, people see not only their communication behaviors, but they also see the unfiltered reaction to their communication by the other parties. My work and the work of others shows that video is a powerful mechanism for changing perceptions and behaviors. And that's what it's going to take to make a difference in communication. It's that behavior change that needs to happen. And video is the best way to achieve that. I think we've all learned a good bit about video on a personal level that probably is very different than your professional and scholarly level. But nonetheless, it sounds to me like video based methods might have been kind of difficult or maybe not even the smartest thing to be doing in the middle of a pandemic. No, you're right about that. So tell us a bit about how that's affected your research. Did you have to stop things? Did you move, find ways to move it forward? Anything new that you discovered in this period? So the pandemic has definitely affected my ability to do video based research but I have found a way to keep it moving forward, still using the power of the visual medium. As a neuroscientist yourself, Dean Hearn, you know that from an evolutionary perspective, the part of our brains that processes visual images is among the oldest. So we are all programmed to react to visual cues. Let me give you an example from a current study that I've got going on. I'm doing this study in partnership with the Henry Ford Health System. And we are trying to improve the education that cancer patients receive from pharmacists about oral oncolytic agents, which are also known as anti-cancer pills. These agents are increasingly being prescribed instead of traditional chemotherapy. But although they are taken in oral form, they are still associated with severe side effects. Research has shown that the side effects from oral anti-cancer pills can be so severe that many patients reduce the dosage or stop taking the pills altogether, often without notifying anyone. In doing so, these patients lower their chances of successful treatment, which means for some of these cancer patients that they can die sooner because they didn't take all of the medication as prescribed. So teaching symptom management strategies is very important. However, Symptoms don't appear until two to four weeks after the patients start taking the pills. And by then they may have forgotten the teaching. So what we are trying to do is we're going to go to patient homes two to three weeks after an education session and video record them as they are experiencing their sessions and then share the videos with the pharmacists who provided the education so that the pharmacists could incorporate what they hear from these patients and what they see on the video into future education sessions. Well, obviously because of COVID, we can't do that now. We can't go into patient homes. So what we're doing instead is we're mailing disposable cameras to patients who are newly prescribed with these um, anti-cancer pills. And we're, at, we're gonna ask the patients to take up to 10 pictures of those things in their homes that either make it easier or more difficult to manage symptoms. Patients will return the cameras to us and we will develop the pictures, making two copies of each picture, numbering the pictures on the back. Then we'll send a set of pictures to the patients and we'll keep a set of pictures for ourselves and we'll have a, a phone interview with the patients asking them to tell us what's, what is in the picture. Tell me about what's in this picture and what in this picture either helps you or hinders your ability to manage symptoms. We will then share these results with the pharmacists who can incorporate the patient strategies into teaching future patients. So one of the things that I hear as you talk about your research now and having seen some of your many papers you've written 
is that you really use partnerships a lot in your research. Yeah. And I understand how partnerships might be very important. But I'm kind of curious about why you set this up that pharmacists will provide the education. And the only reason I ask is, as I said earlier, part of every nurse's role is to educate their patients and clients, whether it's how to give an insulin injection, how it is to drop your blood pressure. So, so why pharmacists in the education? Yeah, so it turns out that in partnering with Henry Ford, um, it is the pharmacists who do the education. And I didn't want to lose that opportunity to do the research just because it's the pharmacists who do the education at Henry Ford and not the nurses. I think whoever does the education, the basic premise is that for this kind of education, the education occurs, the patients get a whole boatload full of papers to take home. But then it's two to three weeks later before they're actually asked to use that information. And then that's where the process falls apart, whether it's nurses or pharmacists who do that education. So that basic premise is the same. In partnering with Henry Ford, you know, people have often asked me, well, why Henry Ford? I mean, why couldn't you do your, your research at the University of Michigan? And we could. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to expand this very practical kind of work into another healthcare system in our state. Another reason is that Henry Ford has a more diverse population than University of Michigan. And so in order to understand a little better about diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's better to have a patient population that represents some of those diverse populations, So, which is why I'm, I'm, I'm there at Henry Ford. However, no matter who does it, whether it's the pharmacists or the nurses, or no matter in what context, whether it's University of Michigan, Henry Ford, any other healthcare system in, in our state or really in the country. I think from my point of view, the important thing is that we really know very little about the patient's point of view or their experience unless we engage with them directly and meet them where they're at. So to my way of thinking, methods that provide visual evidence of the patient perspective are powerful tools that we can use to meet the goal of improving patient care, no matter who provides it or in what facility. All patients deserve the best care possible. And I believe that really listening to them and gathering visual evidence of their lives as we listen is the first step towards achieving that goal. Well, that's a beautiful summary statement. I do want to put one more question out, which is, if I remember correctly, and I think I do, you've been a bedside intensive care nurse for a great many years, and you actually only stopped your practice about maybe two years ago. Yeah. So how were you able to blend that intense ability as being a very expert clinician with a great year's experience with this focus on patient safety? Well, I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record and I'm going to steal a page from Sue Ann's playbook because it was actually the synergy. I was able to use my experience in the hospital and at the bedside to inform my research. I saw in my own practice firsthand what happens when the organization or when the system was not configured in a way that allowed me to provide safe patient care. So as a very terrible example, and I won't name the facility where this happened, but at one point in my practice, um, they had a policy in place where the nurses were required to take the meal trays out of the patient rooms and deliver it to a dirty utility room, which was outside of the unit. And I thought to myself, wow, that's kind of like a strange use of my time as a registered nurse, that it me that I would have to leave my patient's bedside, go outside of the unit altogether to deliver an empty meal tray. That's one very small but very pertinent example of how patient safety could have possibly been compromised by that activity. That then fuels my research to understand that healthcare system. I'm a health services research. How is the health system configured in a way that can allow me to provide the base, best patient care? Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Dean Hurd. Let me send this back to Colleen. So Melissa, we have one question from the audience, and that is, are you incorporating te uh, telehealth into your work? Yes, definitely. So um, we're definitely looking at telehealth. Thank you for that great question. You know, one of the things, especially with COVID now, is that the patients can't see the faces of the care providers or often their loved ones, right? So what we're trying to do is look at a relatively inexpensive use of telehealth so that the patients can still have some kind of technology, whether it's an iPad 
whether it's some kind of other uh, device so that they can see the faces and be able to react to them. Patients, um, when you watch a patient in a hospital room, they glom onto your eyes, especially if you're the physician, for those few minutes that a physician is with the patients in the room, that patient is looking in the doctor's eyes, how am I doing today, right? And so it's so important to have that access to the face. Um, so by using um, telehealth, by using um, technological advances, either in the hospital or in the telehealth system more broadly in primary care, we can actually make a difference. And uh, that's one of the grants that I'm working on actually right now. Thank you, Colleen. Terrific, terrific. Well, thank you very much for your time and for your expertise in sharing uh, what you're doing with your research. Uh, with that, I would like to bring this webinar to a close. I want to thank all our participants today, Dr. Kristen Choi, Dean Hearn, our students, Nathan Stefanovsky and, and Zoe Rattel, uh, Dr. Sue Ann Bell, and Dr. Milinovich. And I'm Colleen Zimmerman, and I want to thank you for joining us today. This webinar series is titled Victors, Heroes, and Wolverines, and as someone who works side by side with these and other nurses every single day, I think they exemplify the definition of victors and wolverines, but especially heroes. As a small show of appreciation for joining us today, we'd like for you to receive a digital copy of our latest issue of the School of Nursing magazine, Panacea. It was just released yesterday. So please watch your inboxes for an email with the magazine attached. And lastly, if you have ever considered supporting nursing or nursing education, now's the perfect time to do so. Sim simply reach out to me or our office at the school and we'll be happy to have a conversation. Again, my name is Colleen Zimmerman and on behalf of all of us at the University of Michigan School of Nursing, thank you for joining us today and forever Go Blue.